So, last talk of the night. Now, APIs are well and good, but my favorite thing to end the night with is a good ops story. Uh, <laughs> and this is one of those. Now, Simon has kind of ruined my reveal here, but I'll do it anyway. The challenge is to move from MySQL to Postgres, and also from AWS to SoftLayer. Um, the story behind this is kind of long and convoluted, but basically, there was sort of, and I'll explain in a second, two different situations that came up at roughly the same time as I landed that meant that both these moves made a lot of sense for us. So let's go through them now. First of all, MySQL. Well, it is a problem generally, it's my personal opinion, but why in particular is MySQL <laughs> a problem? Uh, first of all thing, and the, the big push for us here is that adding columns is slow. Now, at the scale of the time, adding a column on our biggest table is about 15 to 20 minutes, so adding four columns was over an hour. That's not really acceptable for a site where you, like, and that locks the table. Like, you know, say that this is our core table that links users to, go to what events they're going to, which is a big part of Lanyard. If that table is locked, the site basically can't run for an hour, so that's kind of unacceptable. At event provider scale, it takes a lot longer to run some of these issues. It can take sometimes multiple days, but we do it sort of um, using uh, Pocona, so it's running in the background, but at Lanyard, we didn't have that option. Uh, data integrity in MySQL is quite poor. It has foreign key support just. Um, it's not amazing foreign key support. It doesn't have certain things like asserting check constraints and asserting sort of types on foreign keys and that kind of stuff. And you can sort of slip nulls into columns that shouldn't be there and it corrupts very easily and all manner of nasty things that is a whole other talk by itself. Um, it has a very limited set of data types. Now, MySQL has strings, it has dates. Uh, it doesn't have time zones on dates, it just has dates. Um, it has a few other things. Postgres has arrays. Postgres has dates with time zones. Postgres has IP address field types. It has a whole manner of rich kinds of fields with their own indexing, their own fast lookup functions, all the stuff you want. Um, and yes, that's one of my, the key thing here is that adding columns is slow. This is the main thing I want us to move. After I think, I think one change took two hours of the site being in that read-only mode Simon showed you earlier, we we're like, okay, this is kind of a bit much now. What do we do? There are many, many other option reasons. This is the whole talk by itself. If you're in Budapest in three weeks' time, I'm giving that talk there, but this is not that talk. So the second problem here is AWS. Now, AWS is kind of a trade-off. Um, it's more expensive than most servers by itself, but the wonderful idealistic goal is that you look like this graph. You have a lovely sort of peaky, you know, this is, this is say, say you're Netflix. This is the evening, this is the middle of the morning. No one, no one watches TV here, everyone watches TV here, right? That's fantastic. So what you do is you have your servers, you, add more than one goes up, you scale down, they drop down again, and you save money in this gap here where you're not running a server. That, that's your money saving. Now, unfortunately, Lanyard's demand looks much more like this. So sort of, it's, it, there, is, there is definitely a curve there, but we had quite a lot of international um, sort of usage of the site. It was quite a flat curve, and most of our demand was on a yearly basis. There's a, there's a big peak around sort of spring and autumn and a big dip in winter. And so we didn't really have that reason to, like, you know, the ops work involved to scale servers at that point, it's, it's so fragile and so difficult, it just wasn't worth the investment for us. So what we're doing is we're paying hourly rates for what we should be using, like in theory, we'll be saving us money here, but actually we're just paying a more expensive hourly rate on this continuous scale. Um, another, another small reason is that disk IO is very slow on virtualized servers. This has improved a bit since, but it's still pretty bad. It's one of the slowest things you see. It's usually 10 times or, or, or worse, slower. And so this kind of feeds into this sort of, this what I call the spectrum of hosting. There are many different kinds of hosting. They kind of run on this thing from very immediately costed and sort of very fixed and generic solutions like AWS, a cloud provider, all the way down to building your own data center, which is a ridiculous proposal, by the way. Don't, don't ever do that unless you're Google. Um, and here, here you've got like cost in the decade. So like, well, we need, to get, we need to get a generator. The waiting list of generators is a year. So you need to factor that into the thing. We need to get all the builders in. Like, it, it becomes a ridiculous prospect. And so somewhere on this scale, and you'll probably move up and down as your company grows and shrinks, uh, you'll sit. So as I, you know, my personal website sits here because it's a good balance between, you know, I'm a, I'm a single person, I have not very much, I'm not a company that much funds, but I want some customization. Uh, Lanyard was over here, I mean, we jumped down two steps to dedicated servers. And so what sort of, what you've got with cloud providers is this wonderful, like, you know, servers are fully available, they spin up map rapidly, but they're kind of expensive. And down here, it takes an hour or two to get a server, and, but you can pick the memory, you can pick the disk types, and they're a lot cheaper on sort of the overall monthly scale. And so that's all, but then, you know, doing it at the same time, like one of these moves is already crazy. Like moving from MySQL to Postgres is already a crazy idea. Combining it with then moving across an entire continent 
at the same time, and changing the kind of hosting you're running seems a bit ridiculous. Um, but there are good reasons why we did this. Uh, three of the key reasons are that both of these need time in read-only mode. Now, read-only mode isn't downtime. It's a lot better than that, but it's still not full site functionality. There's still issues with it. You're not logged in. You can't attend and track new events. You can't create events. So it's not a preferable mode to be in. And at this point, we'd had, I think, about six or seven hours in read-only mode in the past two months. And so we were kind of worried we don't have too, mu too much more of it. Both of them involve copying the whole data set, which is sort of the reason behind read-only mode. Like both of these moving data center and also moving your database involve freezing your database in time, mutating it somehow, being it moving across contents or changing the format of it, and then reloading it. And so they kind of, and this is the last one here, they, they interleave very nicely. Both of these concepts sort of, as you'll see in the plan later on, can be done sort of in step with each other in a way that they use fractionally more time than an individual one, you get so much more done. So the key trick here, I think the, 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 the harder of the two things, is converting MySQL to Postgres. Now, this, at the start of this project, was kind of like an idealistic goal. Like, I would love to convert MySQL to Postgres. It'd be amazing. But how would you do that? Like, they're very different databases. They have different column types, different formats, different dump type. Everything is different about them. They both run SQL. That's about the same. And even then, the SQL doesn't really match properly. And so your key thing here is you start with MySQL. Excellent place to start if you're getting away from it. Um, you then dump that in Postgres compatible format. Now, I think at some point in the past, this was Postgres compatible. It hasn't been for at least a decade. And so you get, you get this file. It's, it's kind of, it, it's not MySQL, but it's not Postgres either. It's kind of a middle ground, like the quoting is wrong, the functions are all named wrongly, but it's, it's a start. And so that, what we have then is we have a second step, which is um, what, we, what we wrote inside Lanyard. is a scripted file conversion. It takes this dump file, turns it into a separate dump file. And what this is doing, this is fixing quoting, this is fixing um, sort of a SQL syntax and small minor variations of things. Um, but it's generally a very quick mapping. Like, you know, this, I think, was a sort of tens of gigabytes file um, and being mapped into a similar size. That conversion took about 10 minutes. Um, it started off being around, I think it was an eight hour conversion and sort of optimized it down. I'll talk about that in a bit in a minute, but working out how we could save time on that conversion and getting it to be a much more efficient conversion. Then you take that SQL file, and because they're moving data centers too, you load it over the network into Postgres. So this is, this is basically PG dump over SSH, um, which actually is more efficient than transferring it and loading it at the same time, because this is disk bound, this is network bound, they kind of cancel out. And so this is streaming from AWS into SoftLayer at this point, loading it in. But the key thing here is that this schema here is not our final schema. Now, one of the differences between MySQL and Postgres, with Django in particular, is the types of columns where you just store things. So, for example, in MySQL, a Boolean is stored as a tiny int one. In Postgres, it's stored as a Boolean type. That's a typecast. That, those are expensive. And initially, this, this scripted file conversion here was doing those in memory. It would see, OK, I know this table is going to convert Booleans, whatever. So I'm going to examine every line in the SQL file, take that line in, parse the fields out, change the value to be true or false, and write it out again. That's why it took eight hours to convert. Um, a sort of a moment of happiness hit me when I realized that Postgres has type conversion built in, and it's a lot faster than my code, because it's written by people who know what they're doing. And so what happens here is there's a second step here where we take our, this schema, which looks basically as a direct mapping of the MySQL schema, and then add in our better types with typecasts. And so this is about 15 minutes-ish. Um, this is about, I'd say, 30 minutes-ish, and this is tens, about 10 minutes. Like, this, this is the, really, really quickly. Um, Postgres is very good at doing typecasts, it turns out, and a lot, of, a lot of things are similar internally, I think. And the nice thing is, I did all this work so you didn't have to, if you ever want to do this. Um, the converter is available at GitHub in this URL. It is deliberately unmaintained because I cannot maintain a crazy idea like this for very long. There are some patches that have been pulled in, but it's, it is, at its basis, a mad idea. And so those don't really take very well to, to being maintained. But it, it's there. It works. I know several friends have used it since. And it's worked perfectly fine for them. So it's something to consider. Um, but overall, like, you know, that's part of the move. But what, how did the move go as a practice? Like, there's a timeline here. There's a lot of organization. Um, Natalie, in particular, is very good at sort of setting timelines and organizing things and getting us all working properly, which is fantastic. Um, but the key thing is the day before, there's some things to do. Like, don't forget. Don't just go, oh, today is fine. It's all tomorrow. All the work's tomorrow. You need to make sure your servers are ready. Key thing, otherwise you'll wake up and be like, ah, panic. Um, and also, sit, make sure your DNS TTL is nice and low. 
Now, not everything honors DNS TTL, which is the sort of um, expiry time for DNS record, but a lot of things do. And uh, five minutes, 300 seconds is sort of the lowest you can generally set it. So that's a good place to, to start. That's all good. Go to sleep, have a nice sleep, have some midnight snacks, whatever. Um, wake up, go. So the key thing is Lanyard is in, what well, was it, in the UK. And so we have the advantage that the morning in the UK is when all of you guys in America are asleep. It's great. And so 9 a.m. in the morning is the best time to move stuff because everyone here is asleep. Our load is basically at its lowest point. And so at that point, put the site into read-only mode, you know, fit that feature flag, check it's there, all good. And then once that's started, we start the database dump conversion. That's part of that flow chart I showed you earlier, sort of the, the first leg of it there. That's all good. Then when the conversion's finished, we can start loading that converted data across the network into the, into the new database. And no, we're not sitting around this time. We, we're also making sure the new servers have got the right crons, all the files have been moved over properly, all that sort of background stuff. But that's quite easy compared to this big task here. Um, once that load is finished, we then make sure the stock's working correctly. So this is the whole team browsing around, checking, and we're sort of pinned to that new DNS place and making sure it's working correctly. And once, the, once we're sure it's working fine, and, the, and this is the point of no return, you switch to the DNS, and you point the load balancers on the old cluster to the new cluster. Thus, even if your DNS is updated, that still works. It's a bit slower, but you're still getting all the people with bad DNS providers, the new version of the site, just proxied via Amazon. And then the point of no return is to exit read-only mode. Once you come out of read-only mode, your databases of your old and new site have diverged, and you cannot ever merge them again. You can roll back in a dire situation, which I think we never did, as far as I remember. You can roll back, but you cannot merge. And so you'll be very sure if we get that last point that, okay, we've moved, it's all fine, this is the future, and then turn it on. And yeah, so, you know, this is a tricky process. It's kind of sort of tight, tightens the muscles, one might say. Um, <laughs> And so with, with that in mind, there's a lot of dry runs here. I ran the database conversion, I think, eight times, and th I think five of those at least had errors, um, particularly the quoting of strings. Um, I think Postgres uses single quotes, and my single use double quotes. You flip them over, and then any double quotes, single quotes inside the strings, flip them over, and then it gets very complicated. And then Unicode came into the fact, course of the factor, and all that was had to be dealt with. But I think after the first five times, I had a good clean run. I did three more for good luck. And then we did two whole dry runs of the whole move, sort of making new servers, copying them over, testing the site, everything but that last segment you saw there. Um, and it's this kind of thing that gives you confidence that you sit down that last day, you're going to launch, you go, you know, me and Tom, one of our other sort of engineers slash ops people, we've sat down, we're sure of this, we're confident about this, we can do this. And like, it's very important to have confidence, especially when, you know, the entire site's livelihood is on the line here. Like, if you roll back or release wrongly, that's not only a PR disaster, but you could lose data in that process. It's very important to get it right. But what did we learn? First of all, it all went well. Hooray! Um, this is a very rare ending to an ops. So I want to point this out. This is very important. Uh, not everything went perfectly. It was a bit slower than I'd like, and there were a few hiccups. We forgot a few things. We caught them all before that last launch. There's a big sort of text document I tried to find but couldn't, unfortunately, to show here um, of sort of all the checklist points we went through and all the different things we did. Uh, Key thing is server load drops. Now, our new soft layer servers were more powerful, had that nice quick disk access as well, and so our server load dropped, and the, the, our graphite graph went like this. Not as much as we would have liked, um, considering the servers were a bit more powerful, but it was a drop at least, and you know, the rest of that load was some other part of our process, and we can look at that later today. Um, the server costs were halved, which we knew, we knew this going in. Like, one of the main reasons for this move away from the like, I, I sat down, worked out, AWS costs this much, Soft load costs this much, this is like half the cost. That was a very big part of getting um, Simon to come on board with this. Like, like this is, we can do this now, we can save this much money per month. And that was a very important thing. And, you know, in a startup, that money, you know, that, that money counts. You can do more work with it, you can have more servers. You know, we had a lot more headroom on our um, server infrastructure for things like big events or South By, which always overwhelms Lanyard every year. Uh, Another fun thing is the SSDs, which we moved all our databases onto, are not a panacea. Um, they don't solve your problems. They are very helpful. They certainly improved our response time, but not amazingly. Um, the kind of disk access that the database does often won't be compatible with these. And also, um, Postgres is by default, because it's actually intelligent, tuned for a hard drive with slow seek time. But you can dive into the Postgres configuration file and say, hello, Postgres, your drive has zero seek time. Go. And it'll optimize its query plans for that new hard drive instead. And so it's much better at planning out and saying, okay, actually hitting this index isn't as costly as hitting this thing in memory and rearrange itself. And when we did that, we saw a nice big, another extra drop in our Postgres time, so that was quite nice. 
And also, and kind of the, the final, most important point here, move before it's too late. If you want to make this move, you can't do it at Eventbrite scale, at least not, not in any kind of reasonable sense. Um, Lanyard was around the 70, 80 gigabyte, gigabyte range at this point. We moved that in about an hour. That seems fine for a site of our size, but any bigger and it starts becoming a problem. So if you're considering this, or considering some other move like different database technology, the earlier you do it, sort of the easier and cheaper it will be, but of course, you have to develop new features. And as a startup with Lanyard specifically, there's always that race between we need to make the site better, we need to add new features, we need to keep going and scaling. And so that, that's always a tricky one to balance out. But this kind of task especially is so much easier if you do it earlier on when your database is smaller. Thank you. Thank you.